Here we go, introduction to emergency management. What we're going to cover tonight is what is civil defence, your risks and hazards, and emergency preparedness. So what is civil defence? So civil defence is New Zealand's system of emergency management. Now I'm summarising here a little, but emergency means a situation that is the result of any happening, whether natural or otherwise. For example, earthquakes, floods, technological failure, epidemics or warlike acts. Anything that may cause loss of life or injury or in any way endanger the safety of the public or property and cannot be dealt with by emergency services or otherwise requires a significant coordinated response. So this photo here is from the 1931 Napier earthquake. It was a magnitude 7.8 and 256 people died. An early example of defence forces, emergency services and community volunteers coming together in a large response. New Zealand has always been vulnerable to devastation from natural forces, and for a period from World War II onwards, there was also the risk of aerial bombing to the global nuclear threat in the late 50s. Competing priorities of natural disasters and military incursion led to the creation of the Civil Defence Act 1962. There have been many changes to the legislation and supporting documents since. We are currently operating under the Civil Defence Emergency Management Act 2002. This act is now under review. The National Emergency Management Agency was established in 2019, replacing the Ministry of Civil Defence Emergency Management. They provide strategic leadership and depending on the emergency, they coordinate central government response and recovery functions for national emergencies and support the management of local emergencies. They also support other lead agencies in the response and recovery of other hazard events. There are 16 civil defence regions in New Zealand, mostly following regional council boundaries. All councils are legislated to have civil defence capabilities. There are a few different models of how that is done in New Zealand, but in Southland, the four councils, Environment Southland, Invercargill City Council, Gore District Council and Southland District Council have created a shared service where all local and regional civil defence responsibilities are coordinated by one team in one location. Civil defence groups can be viewed as a consortium of the local authorities in a region working in partnership with emergency services, lifeline utilities like power companies and government departments among other things, to identify and understand hazards and risks and to prepare group plans and manage the hazards and risks in accordance with the four R's, reduction, readiness, response and recovery. So these here are several, but not all of the organisations and agencies we work with. So this is our region. We cover from just north of Milford Sound, down to and including Stewart Island. Southland is the second largest geographic district but it is the second most sparsely populated. Southland is a beautiful place with lots of key sites to visit, but at the same time, we are at risk. We have coastal areas, rivers and lakes, old buildings and fault lines. This is our team, led by our group controller, Simon Mapp. Seven of us are based in Invercargill, and Alice is based at Dunedin University and concentrates on all things related to the Alpine Fault. Between us all, we have previous experience, both paid and voluntary, in council compliance, environmental management, business management, community development, police, fire and emergency New Zealand, Red Cross and Landsar. So we're just a small team. There is no large civil defence army coming over the hill. So we teach communities to be prepared just in case so that they can look after themselves until help arrives, which could take some time. What is most valuable in a response is the ability of the community to support and look after themselves and others. The people who live in and understand their communities know who the most vulnerable are and where to find resources to support others, especially in the early stages. So I'll get you to jump in your chat now and have a guess at what some of these dates might represent. Have a go. For the years 1717 to 2009, 
what do you think could have affected the area circled in orange? Anyone can have a go? Earthquakes, it is earthquakes. 1717, it was a key event, keep in mind for later. So the next one, 1913 to 2020. Does anyone remember? 2020 feels like a long time ago with everything we've had going on, but does anyone remember what happened in 2020? Not quite COVID, for 1913 onwards, there's a lot of events covering across Southland in these arrows. Floods, yep. We have are an area very much prone to flooding. What about the next one, 1820, 1868? Now that was quite some time ago. Where the arrows lead to give you a bit of a clue. Oh, shall I give you the answer? Tsunami. Now this one encompasses all of Southland, 1939, uh, 1939 and 2010. What event could have happened that could have covered all of Southland? Oh, someone's typing away. Snow, 2010 was a considerably sized event. Now we have plenty of other events that aren't included in this, but these ones are the more significant ones. So what's the last one? It's fairly obvious because it's still ongoing. It was mentioned earlier. It's a bit too obvious, isn't it? COVID, 2019 onwards. So here are a few photos of events that we've previously had. We often think of Canterbury when we think civil defence emergencies, and for good reason. They've had more than their fair share, but Southland's not immune to natural events. So flooding in 1913, 1940, and of course 1984. Snow in 2010, damage winds a new world and collapsed our stadium Southland's roof. And then a severe storm in 2013 caused 20 avalanches along the Milford Road and a major landslide on the Lower Holyford Road. So keeping all of those in mind, what are our top three hazards in Southland? We've got earthquakes, floods and tsunami. The frequency of tsunami isn't that often, however due to the devastation it could cause, we do count it as a major potential hazard. So we'll start with floods. Just pop back. Floods happen fairly frequently and can cause a lot of damage. They're usually caused by heavy rain or thunderstorms. They can cause injury and loss of life, damage to property and pollute our water and land. Floods become dangerous if the water is very deep or traveling very fast or has risen very quickly. They can contain debris like tree branches and sheets of iron. So this is a nightscape map of all our waterways in Southland, um, which is quite impressive. It's not really a stretch to see why flooding is our most common hazard. So we have a monitoring system, lots of data and lots of warning. At Emergency Management Southland, we have a team member on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week to monitor everything and discuss possible risks with the Environment Southland Science teams and outside organisations like Met Service. Environment Southland has a team that monitors the river levels, rainfall and soil moisture. So there's a lot of technology to give us the most up to date information to make an informed decision on what potential outcomes might be. Invercargill Airport. This is 1984. Over 5000 people were evacuated across Southland, including me, and 1200 houses were rendered unlivable. So this is the Waihopo River flooding Grasmere and Prestonville suburbs in the same 1984 flood. 
No human lives were lost, but there was huge losses in livestock. More than 12,000 sheep, some cattle, pigs and deer, as well as 170 kilometres of fences and 52 farm bridges. So this is Matara in 1913. It's the freezing works and paper mill. If you look very closely at the top there, there is two men sitting on the roof waiting to be rescued. And then this is Matera just over 100 years later, January 2020. So it shows no matter what infrastructure we've got, nature never really changes. So lots of bridges also carry service cables for things like fibre connections. So if a bridge is lost, it can also isolate communities further. For other reasons, this is Pyramid Bridge in 2018. and the power of rivers in flood. This photo has proven to be quite popular. It's very dangerous. It shows what can be carried down and left behind when the water recedes. It's a 2020 picture. So this is the red weather warning for Milford in 2020. See in the front there, that's my boss's half eaten muffin. Now, you know, if she leaves muffin, something's terribly wrong. Over 500 people were evacuated by year, the largest aerial evacuation ever in New Zealand. This red weather warning was the first for New Zealand under the new warning system. All red weather warnings issued by Met Service since across New Zealand have ended up as declared states of emergency. As Mallory mentioned, there's a Met Service presentation next week. Keep an eye on our Facebook page for the link. So earthquakes. Southland does have faults other than the Alpine Fault. So we've got the Hiroko Fault here on the left, and news just out in this last week mentions the Nevis Fault that runs down to near Garston. The research on that says that it could potentially generate a magnitude seven earthquake similar to the 2007, uh, sorry, similar to the 2010 September Christchurch earthquakes. So it just runs down the side here. More research is being done in Southland. Um, there hasn't been that much done to date, but the topography does lend to the idea that there are more fault lines that haven't been noted yet. But our most famous one, the Alpine Fault. I have a wee video that I will play with Dr. Carolyn Orcherson. I'll just swap the sounds around, get it started. This is the Alpine Fault, and it's where the Pacific Plate and the Australian Plate meet. A fault is a break in the Earth's crust where one side of the fault is moving relative to the other, but it happens in a short, sharp movement during an earthquake. So this light green rock is the Pacific Plate, and it's been dragged up from depth over many millions of years, and it's sitting on top of the Australian Plate. So this is the Alpine Fault, and that did take time at plate boundary right before our very eyes. The Alpine Fault is an 800 kilometre long structure and it carves its way right down the western side of the Southern Alps in the South Island of New Zealand. And the Alpine Fault is of concern to us because it has the potential to release a magnitude 8 earthquake sometime in the next few years. But the paleo seismic evidence on the Alpine Fault tells us that over the last 8,000 years there have been 26 magnitude 8 earthquakes. Those events have happened incredibly regularly through time. So given that the Alpine Fault has a long history of generating these big earthquakes, it's highly likely that we'll have another one within our lifetime. During an Alpine Fault earthquake, we'd expect horizontal movement of about eight or nine metres and vertical uplift of two or three metres. The Alpine Fault is a very long fault. And when there's an Alpine Fault rupture, it's going to break the surface right along that length. So we're expecting a 400 kilometre rupture of the Alpine Fault. Now, where you get surface rupture is where the most damage is done. So if there's a road, a bridge, or a community living across the Alpine Fold itself, it's going to be really badly affected. It's going to have a very broad impact across the South Island. Our highway network, our power communications, all of our critical infrastructure will be really badly affected by this Alpine Fold event. 
when we have an alpine fault earthquake, it's really important that people are prepared beforehand. Because the more prepared you can be, the more comfortable your life is going to be afterwards. So we all have a part to play in earthquake preparedness. So I just want to reiterate what Carolyn said. It was thought until recently that there was a 30% chance of the Alpine Fault rupturing in the next 50 years. The most up-to-date research that was released last year in April has indicated that risk has increased to a 75% chance. The findings also suggest that the next Alpine Fault earthquake has an 82% likelihood that it will be a magnitude 8 plus event. So this is a photo of Christchurch Colombo Street. To orientate yourself a little bit, look for that Coke sign on the building. And this is what it looks like after the event. This is a very good example of why you don't go running in and out of buildings during an earthquake. The next video also shows that example. Uh, there is no sound with this next video. This is security footage filming the street. If you look very closely, there's a man here just as the earthquake starts happening. And see that man coming walking out who is very, very lucky. So what should you do when an earthquake happens? Drop, cover and hold. Stay where you are. Seek cover if it's very handy. Usually with an earthquake that big, you'll find even if you attempted to walk somewhere, the ground would be shaking too much and you'd actually be at more risk of injury. So we'll move on to tsunamis now. There is three types of tsunamis. So this red line here kind of follows the Pacific Rim of Fire, if you're familiar with it. That would be a distance or tsunami. So that would take more than three hours to get to us. A large earthquake triggered over by South America would have about 14 to 16 hours notice. The yellow lines here, that's a regional tsunami. So we'd have about one to three hours travel time. And then the white is a local source tsunami, which is very close to New Zealand, about an hour or less. We don't have tsunami sirens in Southland, and if it's close by, we may not have time to warn everybody. So don't wait for an official warning. If you're near the coast and an earthquake is long or strong, then move yourself inland. This is a photo of the local area a bit closer. Now you'll see from the top there, this here starts up there, comes down as the Kermadec Trench, runs along the east coast of the North Island. This is the Hikarungari Trench. And then out the bottom of New Zealand, it's called the Perska Trench. So that's where our plates join together. Either end of that, there would be the potential to generate an earthquake large enough to cause a tsunami to hit New Zealand at fairly short notice. So this is our Invercargill Tsunami Evacuation Zone map. There is further research to be done to clarify the hazard zones, but I wanted to include it anyway to show how close we are to the waterways. So we have our estuary here that runs up the side of Invercargill. And Invercargill CBD, places like the warehouse, are only a matter of a couple of blocks away. 
to keep in mind. Now I have a video here. And this is after the large earthquakes in the Kermit X last year. It was 8.1. No sound with this either. You can see the wave coming up the bay. This is the Tutukaka Marina. The water seems fairly calm that's coming in, but there was actually a lot of boats damaged in that marina. So this photo here is the Tonga tsunami just a couple of months ago. This was generated by volcanic eruption. So tsunami waves are driven by gravity and travel around 200 metres per second, but the eruption caused an atmospheric shock wave, which moved at more than 300 metres per second. And through the energy transferring from the atmosphere to the ocean, the shock wave amplified the ocean waves, pushing them further afield and accelerating their travel time, which means it got to New Zealand much faster than expected. As most tsunamis are created by earthquakes, there's not a lot of data on tsunamis caused by volcanoes. If you look at the lower left picture here, you'll see the wave is actually only about a metre high, but you can see the devastation caused by what would be considered a low wave. This is why whenever a land threat is advertised, it does pay to take it seriously. So what are types of tsunami warning? All the natural ones, so a long, a, say a minute or more, or strong, where you're kind of knocked off your feet, earthquake. A sea level change, often the sea can recede before tsunamis come in or any unusual noises, sort of a washing machine sound to it. So what we say to do if an earthquake is long or strong, you get gone. So the new normal, what is normal? With climate change events not only happening more frequently, the severity is also increasing. So with protective measures being put in place like higher riverbanks, there is a sense of security building closer to hazards. However, if those protection systems fail, the results are so much more damaging. With transport and technology, we've never been more connected and yet so much more vulnerable than previous generations to worldwide events. So this is where the four R's I mentioned at the start come in. Reduction, readiness, response and recovery. What would you do? So we used to think it was best to be quite structured in telling people how to be ready, but one size doesn't fit all. So now we want people to understand it's about having simple plans, which are easy to manage for your own situations. We are all responsible for our own safety. What you can do for yourselves and your families before can make a huge difference in the hours and days after an event. And if you plan for the worst as much as you can, then the small things like getting home from work to a power cut or your water is off for a few hours and you miss the memo, won't be such an inconvenience as you already have things in place to cope. So how can you reduce your risk? Learn what hazards are around you. Simple things like securing TVs and bookshelves, having your insurance up to date, being prepared so that when something happens, you know what to do, what resources you have to respond, and then the recovery afterwards would be less stressful. So what does readiness look like? What would you do if you had no power? How would you see? How would you cook? Keep warm. Power cuts can affect FPOS machines and ATMs, so it pays to have some cash at home or enough supplies to see you through three days or more. Imagine having no water for three days. How would you wash, cook, clean? What would you drink? Water supplies, including drinking water, could be affected in an emergency. So it is essential to have a supply of stored water. Needing to evacuate. Some houses, streets and neighbourhoods may not be safe to stay in and you may have to leave home in a hurry. If your street was evacuated, where would you go? What would you take? 
What about your pets? And do your neighbours need your help? No internet or phones. What's your plan if you can't get a hold of each other at work or at school at home? Does everyone know in your house know what to do to get back to each other? Being prepared doesn't have to be expensive or time consuming. Little things like washing out a juice bottle when you're finished and filling it up with water and storing it. If you only have a heat pump at the risk of a power outage, hot water bottles are fairly cheap to grab with your weekly shop to throw into a cupboard. And you don't need a fancy chemical toilet. You can just grab a 20 litre bucket from Mitre 10 instead and you can put a plastic bag in it. Any preparation gets you one step closer to being ready than doing nothing at all. So this last photo here, this is the Milford Sound evacuation to Tianao in the 2020 floods. You can see civil defence, police, Red Cross volunteers, Abel Kramer, Southland District Council, Deputy Mayor, all jumping in to assist. But a large part of the work was done by volunteers that are part of the Tianao Community Response Group and other community members. This is a group that came together to set up a community emergency hub to help look after the displaced people until everyone could sort their accommodation and travel, etc. These are everyday people from everyday walks of life that have put their hands up to assist their community in times of emergencies. Mallory, as mentioned before, is doing a presentation tomorrow night on community response groups. If this sounds like something you could be interested in, then jump on to see what it's about. That is the end of the presentation. Move over to the chat. Do we have any questions? Thanks, Ali. I'll pop this slide across here. If you are after more information, there's a few places you can check. So you can have a look at our website. We have lots of information on there to help you prepare for if you're at home, if you're at school or if you're at work. If you haven't liked our Facebook page already, please do so. When we receive weather warnings and those kinds of things, we pop all that information up onto our Facebook page. And you can head to Get Ready as well, and that has more information on being prepared and what hazards we have.